Uh, so with that, uh, with, with AV Pros and the introduction and the, and the, and the, the launch this year, again, a lot of SKUs we introduced into our, our mainframe. Guys are using it. Um, the two of you guys go perfectly well together, uh, hand in hand with, with fiber and, and AV distribution. So with that, let's get into some stuff. Um, we did do a tour, like I said, in February. Um, so I think that uh, you might have a very educated attendee today, boys, maybe, who knows? So we urge your questions. If there's something that you guys have installed in the past six months, great, let's bring that up. I don't wanna uh, veer off course from what these guys have to present, but you know, what, who I see already, a lot of volume tone guys, let's, let's talk real tech, hit your questions in here and uh, let's make this a good use of our time. This one is 90 minutes. So uh, we're gonna start off with Steven Ricks and then we will go into Steve Baker's uh, presentation with AV Pro. Um, with that, uh, I'll keep this thing recorded. You guys are going to get an email from me at four o'clock. Uh, there will be not only the presentation uh, that they are, uh, that's on their slide deck, but it will be also this video as well. So that's it from me. Happy Friday, guys. We're getting through it. It is definitely getting busier. The volume tone shops are, are open. Well, they're open to a certain extent, but we're going to have more employees starting on Monday. So uh, I think we're weathering the storm pretty well. Remember, um, it, we're in partnership with, uh, with uh, Allnet and MRI and Custom Plus up north. Uh, great partnerships. We are the SNAP local distribution network. We're here for you. So guys, let, without, without further ado, my two favorite gentlemen to tour with, trust me, these guys can, can do a dinner like you would not believe, especially my next guest, Stephen. This guy can make you a steak. Unbelievable. All right, with that being said, my two pals, let's have a good day, guys. Stephen Ricks from Clearline, virtual. Here we go. Good morning, everyone. So I am going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what it is that uh, Clearline does here. And the main thing that we're gonna go over today is, you know how to specify fiber. I am going to do a uh, live termination demo to show you just how easy it is. And just kind of go over all the parts, pieces of fiber and if you have any questions, certainly reach on out. I'll be giving all of my information at the end. Um, as Gary said, I absolutely um, am a huge proponent of AV Pro. Steve and I have worked for, together for years, um, great friends, and uh, we also both worked for Custom Plus that was uh, acquired by Snap. So part of the whole thing is uh, we feel like we're part family as well. So let me get into this. So why do you use fiber? So some of the things that we're gonna go over um, is the basics and benefits of using fiber and some of the different things that we're going to do. Then I'll be answering some questions. So reasons to use fiber. So I, I hear from many different people about the distance is the first time that they got into using fiber is they ran out of the 330 feet that's the limitation on copper and they decided that they need to run fiber so they could go longer. That's just one of the benefits. Data throughput. So some of the things with data that we can do is throughput on multi-mode can do a hundred times to the ninth level so basically at 500 feet you can go it's 1 billion bits 100 billion bits that you can go so the speed is something that we're not running into at this point in time um, that you're even bumping up against distance we know of and we've talked about latency is one of the others when you're doing a security camera system and you're collect and you're connecting two switches to each other you now have the ability to have real-time speed of light between the two. So you're not going to run into the delays and the jitter and the other issues that you run into. And so also connecting switches, when we're doing single mode, if you've got two homes, two miles, four miles, 30 miles apart, you can connect them up with fiber. And again, it's just like you've got those switches stacked. So, some of the big advantages, non-conductive. So depending on where you are in the country, we run into this in the South where there's a lot of 
lightning strikes and such, if you have a, a guest house, a pool house, a main house, and a lightning strike happens today, and you've got copper run between there, it's gonna fry most of the systems. If you run fiber between those, it's going to isolate the systems from one another. That is a big advantage. It doesn't corrode, so over time, you're not gonna run into an issue. It's just as easier, and I would say easier, to terminate than copper. It also can handle a lot more um, bandwidth and is more of a future-proof solution. It's lightweight and takes up less room. I work with a lot of yachts. I work with a lot of um, different industries where the weight for 144, 600 runs makes a big difference. So I'll get into this a little bit. Um, I know Steve dives in a little bit deeper on some of this stuff, but uh, um, one of the big things that we look at is 4K, 8K resolutions, enhanced HD audio and eARC. So virtual reality and dynamic HDR, deeper color depth, greater color spectrum. I like to talk about how we can have substantially more colors, about 880,000 when doing uncompressed fiber, video transmission of more than a few meters, and impervious to EMI and RFI. So I always ask guys, how often do you go out to a job? You've got a, a one inch conduit, you ask for a two inch conduit, and when you get there, there's already electrical in there. Well, the joy of fiber is you can run that right next to your high voltage and you're not gonna run into any issues. So single mode versus multi-mode. This isn't something that um, is single strand versus dual strand. This is the distance is the main issue here. So single mode fiber is nine microns. So you can't tell the difference between nine and 50 microns without a microscope. So the big difference, single mode, think of a sniper rifle, multi-mode, think of a shotgun. So this allows you, multi-mode fiber can go up to about 1300 feet. Multi-mode fiber is what many of the products in our AV industry use because the fiber is a little more expensive, but the electronics are less. In single mode, you have the ability to do much greater distances, but the electronics are a little bit more. You need to make sure that you're running the correct fiber for the electronics that you're using. So basic elements. So we got our cable jacket, then you've got the strengthening fibers, the coating, the cladding, and the core. So I'll get into that when I'm doing my demo to show off all the different parts and pieces and some of the best practices that we can get into. So what makes Clearline Fiber a better product and, and different from the rest of the items on the industry? So I'm gonna use a couple props here. So what I have here is a 12 strand of traditional fiber and a 12 strand of clear line fiber. The difference being is you'll notice that this one is substantially thicker. Traditional fiber has a pull strength of 20 pounds. It's also very, very brittle. Our tagline, you'll see the SSF stands for safer, stronger, faster. And what that has to do with is a single piece of fiber, if I take this and I bend it, I just broke that piece of fiber. Our fiber has 10,000 times the bend radius and is 10 times as strong. Pull strength, again, 20 pounds on traditional fiber, 225 pounds, 160 sustained on clear line fiber. All of our fiber and everything that we build is industry standard. You can use our connectors on Corning glass. You can use Corning's connectors on our glass. You can use anything single mode to single mode, multi-mode to multi-mode, LC, SC, APC, any of the different connectors. Everything that we do is based off of industry standard. So what do we do differently? 
So one of the things that many people that have ever seen fiber understand is the brittle nature. You would never ever take a piece of fiber and do this because it could break off in your hand and would cause an issue. Also, when I strip back the fiber, I can use my thumb and forefinger and I can actually be, try not to blind everybody there, but um, I can use just my thumb and forefinger to do this. So I'm gonna show you a quick demo on what we can do with ClearLine. So when I take a piece of the fiber, the most important thing to do is to take the barrel, put the barrel onto the fiber, then strip it back. I'm gonna separate the Kevlar from the fiber. This Kevlar, I want to remain on. This is also the best practice of how to pull the fiber. This is what has the strength. If you pull from the jacket, you will stretch it out. And I hope you can see there's a little blue coating on the fiber itself. This is our Acrylite Soft Peel. This is a product that we do in conjunction with 3M. It is a proprietary product that allows us to have a stronger fiber. I then take my cleaver, I drop my fiber into the cleaver, and the reason for this is to get that proper cut. As you can see now, you can see that there's light all the way down the fiber. When we go to make the proper cut, you won't see that anymore because we've got a perfect cleave. I then take my connector, I slide this on in, you can see the light in the window. I push forth until that light goes out. I lock it down. I make sure that I get that Kevlar in there for strain relief. I give it a couple twists here, get that Kevlar in there. Trim that Kevlar off and then slide on the cover. I can do these in about 30 seconds. So this is one of the big advantages that we get into is being able to, again, safer, stronger, faster, being able to terminate it. So getting into taking a look if you have fiber on a job existing and what to do to terminate it, or if you don't, how to specify it. So if you have existing fiber on your project, get a part number, figure out what it is. If you see a nine, it's going to be single mode. If you see a 50, it's going to be multi-mode. Color of the jacket also has a big difference. When we look at, <coughs> when we take a look at something like this, which is multi-mode in the aqua, that is going to be a color designation that you're going to find for multi-mode. For single mode, it's going to be yellow. Some of the older fibers, had some other colors that they had. This is something we can always help you with, but for the most part, you're going to see yellow and you're going to see teal. If it's in an outdoor jacket, strip back underneath and you're going to be able to see the color. If an existing fiber has 62.5 on it, think of that as your cap three of fiber. It's an old technology that's not, it's not unable to be worked with what we have today but it takes a little bit more work and we can walk you through that if you happen to run into it. So if you don't have fiber on your project, the big question to ask, again, going back to multi-mode versus single mode, what is your distance? If you're under a thousand feet, you're probably looking at a multi-mode application. If over a thousand feet, you're looking at most likely a single mode situation. If you are in the commercial space, you'll find that single mode is used very often. If there's existing hardware on the job, this is where you need to determine if it's single mode or multi-mode so that you can run the correct fiber and how many strands you require and then the type of connector. So we'll get into a couple things. So simplex. 
Simplex is a single strand of fiber. I never recommend selling Simplex, duplex at the bare minimum, because in a networking application, two fibers is what you need for send and receive. So duplex is our most popular. This is a 37 cent a foot cable. It's stocked at all of the different locations and you're going to be able to find it, run it, and it's nice and easy. We then get into micro distribution. So with micro distribution, we go from two strands to 144 strands. And for some of you who have never seen it, this here, about the same diameter as a Cat 6A or a Cat 7, is 144 strand fiber. We then get into breakout. Breakout is for individually stranded fibers in one jacket. We then get into our direct burial, and this is a super heavy duty armored corrugated steel fiber for direct burial. Then we have our aluminum interlocking. This is done in commercial inside of warehouses and buildings. <clears throat> we then have our tactical. This is a more specialized cable. This is designed much like a microphone cable so it doesn't retain its shape. Um, it can be wound up, a lot of live event and rental. We do make a, a cool little fiber um, that has fiber and power in it. So again, this is only in multi-mode because as you understand, copper has a distance limitation even for power. So figuring out the distance you need this for. We sell a lot of this for 10 gig wireless access points. We also make a two plus two um, product that allows you to have two cat sixes, two strands of fiber. And also we have a product that has become very popular. This is a rugged micro distribution. The rugged micro is two six or 12 strands. It's designed to be run in conduit. So where you aren't able to pull easily the direct burial, the rugged micro fits very well into conduit applications. It's rodent resistant, it's water resistant jacket. So this has become a very popular one. Connectors. So single mode versus multi-mode. The smaller connector is an LC connector. It is a lucent connector. They are the ones who turn around and came up with the connector. Then we have the SC connector, which is what I terminated earlier. Think of that as your square connector. If it is multi-mode, it is that aqua color. If it is single mode, it's blue. That's a very easy way to find out and, and see what exactly is on a job if you're coming across existing fiber. Also, it's very important that you put single mode connectors on single mode fiber and multi mode on, mul on multi mode cable. Think of it as quarter inch pipe trying to connect to one inch pipe. You're not going to be able to do it without a lot of loss. So, networking. When we talk about needing two strands and going into everything, being able to run two strands to an SFP module on your switch, that is a cross connection. Probably the number one call I get is, I've tested my cable, it works, I've installed everything, and it's not connected. It is a cross connector. You do have a send and receive on each of the little GBIC model modules that fit into the SFP. SFP stands for small format plug. This is an application where if you have a single fiber run between switches, again, just that duplex um, will work well. Um, this is a video application here that allows you to go in and be able to run fiber between there. Again, being able to do full uncompressed. Um, Steve will be talking about the solutions that they make. They've got uh, quite a few that allow you to do it over fiber to get your best picture, uncompressed video, and a lot of other benefits. So 
ClearLine is a full end-to-end -end solution. What we want to make sure that you understand is we have everything you need to do any job. We have your bulk fiber that I walked you through. We have all of the connectors, all of your patch cables and jumpers. We build enclosures. We have all the termination kits, your test kits, cleaning, which is very important, and actable, active optical HDMI. This is something that is very awesome and we absolutely love. Our HDMI cables have four strands of our fiber inside. So today it's an 8K cable that allows you to be able to do full 8K 2.1 HD. Now if down the road you run into an issue where you have a problem with somebody ran the fiber cable backwards. If um, somebody turns around and cuts the head off, you can actually terminate it with a connector on one of the four strands, buy a, a fiber balin from Steve, and now you can solve that problem. So we make these from five meters to 40 meters, and we've got eight different sizes. Um, they are in stock at Volutone, Allnet, um, Custom Plus. Um, couple questions. Uh, are the connectors ultra or angled? We make both. So we do APCs, UPCs, um, and then custom pre-terminated fiber. We do. Um, we have been doing uh, custom pre-done lengths for a while now. Um, you can get that with a pull sock. You can get it with um, all sorts of different, different fibers, different ends. Basically, we can specify that for you. So we can make all of those connectors for you. A lot of times when you understand that how easy it is to make a custom cable costs a significant amount more than just doing it yourself. So multiple things we can chat about. Again, rack enclosures, wall enclosures, adapter plates. Um, we do indoor and outdoor termination boxes and all the adapters to go in there. We do keystones. We basically have all the different options. So this is one of my favorite slides. This is something that I talk to dealers about that if you've ever eaten at a Panda Express, you can do fiber. So choose one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. It really is just that simple. So if you choose multi-mode or single mode, then the type of cable you need, and then the connector, all you have to do is follow this flow chart and that'll allow you to figure out how to design up a fiber system. This chart here is one that allows you to see every type of fiber we make in every type of configuration. Do we make it in single mode or multi-mode? Is it riser rated? Is it plenum? Is it direct burial? Is it armored? This is a great sheet. We have this on our website. Again, Gary is gonna be sending out the presentation so you'll be able to have that. And then most importantly, this is my email address, this is my phone number. Write this down, give me a call. I'm kind of like the Maytag man, I'm sitting around and I get about four to five calls a day. I help design systems. Now that I'm not living on the road, I got plenty of time to help anybody out with what they're doing. And being able to answer your questions and, and get everybody up to speed, it's something that uh, we really want to do at ClearLine. So let me know how I can be of assistance for you. If you have any questions, ask them on up. I'll be uh, answering them and, and working with them. But at this time. Got a couple questions. Okay. Uh, are, um, are the connectors ultra or angled? I hit that. Um, Did you? Okay. Did you get yes. all these questions here? Sorry. Yes. And our second question. Okay. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Baker. And uh, Steve's going to get you all educated on uh, AV Pro. Great guys, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, that was uh, a great setup. 
obviously everything you talked about kind of uh, flows into what I'm going to talk about, which is the great thing about doing these joint presentations. Uh, let me bring up my uh, my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see that. I uh, want to say thanks to everyone for taking the time to be on the webinar. I know that uh, at this point, there's probably some webinar overload going on out there. You know, in this new virtual world, this is, this is how we're communicating. Uh, fortunately, I was in the market just a couple months ago. Stephen and I did a uh, kind of a rollout tour and got to meet a lot of you face-to-face. Uh, -face. So uh, with this presentation, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna rehash a little bit of what we talked about. I realize there may be some people on the, uh, on the webinar who weren't at that tour, but I'm also going to talk about um, some of the existing products and new features that we've added and some of the new products that we've, uh, we've come out with, um, which is one of the things that we do. We're constantly uh, looking at you know, products that we can, we can engineer to provide solutions. We're a very solution-driven company, and uh, we've always got some stuff in the pipeline, and I'll, I'll talk about some of that as well. So we, uh, as a company, we've been around for a little while, and I'm going to go through some of uh, com the company history, but very briefly, because some of you are, have already heard it. Uh, those of you who haven't, I think some of it is, is important to convey. Um, under the AV Pro Global Holding header, we've got uh, three brands, the AV Pro Edge HDMI connectivity products that we make, Meridio, which is our line of test generators and analyzers for HDMI video, and then bullet train HDMI cables. Uh, with this presentation, I'm going to try to cover three key topics. One is 4K HDR distribution and how to maximize the existing copper infrastructure that's out there. Uh, I think we're all aware now that signals are getting tougher to, to deal with. We're seeing more and more 4K HDR wide bandwidth material. And uh, a lot of what's out there is existing copper, existing category wire. So we, you know, we need to find ways to, to maximize the existing structure that's already there. We can't always run fiber, although ultimately, you know, wider bandwidth is what we're after. Uh, next topic is, is uh, some new developments um, in signal stabilization, new products, new technology that we've, uh, we've developed to try and stabilize these systems. Because uh, now we have, a, in many cases, a, a, a higher bandwidth infrastructure. We've got products that require uh, the higher bandwidth signals to do their thing. And we're also trying to incorporate a lot of legacy stuff, you know, cable boxes and satellite set-top boxes that are spitting out sometimes 720p and you know, signals that now we have to try and, uh, and deal with and so we make sure everything plays together well. And then uh, lastly, you know, why it really is the time for fiber. You know, products that we have available now, what we have in the, in the works, and uh, you know, why we wanna be running fiber. Uh, just real quick uh, company overview for those of you who haven't been exposed to us before. We are a little different. I like to emphasize that. Um, has a lot to do with how we design the products we do, uh, why we do. Uh, we, uh, we approach things a little differently. I always put support number one on the list because we're a very integrator focused company. Uh, we approach support differently. If any of you have ever dialed in and talked to our guys, you'll, you'll realize that uh, we do take a different approach. You'll never get someone in a cubicle looking at a screen who's got to run through a script every time you call in. Uh, everyone's in one room. We see all the incoming trouble tickets. We all kind of know what the problem of the day is. And uh, we work collaboratively to offer solutions uh, when you call in to hopefully get to the problem quickly. And uh, that has to do with whether the problem is our product or somebody else's. We won't hang up and tell you to call someone else. We're going to stay on the line and figure out what the issue is. As I said, we're a solutions-driven company, and uh, that's one of the way, one of the ways that we identify issues out there, problems that need to be addressed. And uh, you know, we're in a position to develop a product to address it. Uh, we do have an edge in development. We uh, we develop all of our own pro uh, products in-house with our own engineers. Um, which is why you'll see some unique technology from us, some unique approaches. Uh, we have an edge in making that product. We do manufacture in China, but that factory is 100% ours. Those employees are ours. 
So we, uh, we have control over the whole process. We're not making other people's products and we're not having somebody else make ours. Um, it is a big advantage. Uh, it is also an advantage that we make test equipment. We're, uh, we're heavily involved in that uh, part of the business. Our CEO, Jeff Murray, was with a company called Sancor for 25 years uh, before creating AV Pro. Big uh, background in, in video test equipment. The fact that we sell these products to manufacturers, to ISF calibrators, integrators, um, creates a, you know, a, an ongoing dialogue about what's being developed, what signals are going to look like down the road. Uh, some of you may be you know, familiar with the fact that three and a half years ago, we were out there talking about 18 gig products and why you needed to have it. A little ahead of the curve, but I think now it's obvious why we wanted that bandwidth because we have products like Apple TV that are pushing the limit and uh, that bandwidth is now necessary. And then uh, we're heavily involved in education. We teach Joel Silver's ISF certification classes. We teach classes that qualify for both CEDIA and Avixa continuing education credits. Uh, we're heavily involved in that end of, uh, end of things. Honestly, it's one of those efforts that raises all boats. The more educated our dealer community is in terms of why these problems arise, what some of the uh, thought process is behind, you know, how we go about fixing them, creates more stable installations, less tech support calls for us, and uh, happier customers overall. And then lastly, we have a 10-year, what we call no BS warranty. Uh, all of our products are, warrant are warranted for 10 years, parts and labor. That includes advanced replacement. Uh, the only thing we ask is that we get a chance to talk with you uh, uh, via tech support first. And uh, that's because roughly 85% of the issues that we have are EDID management issues. Those are not issues that are fixed with a hardware swap, but rather uh, using the tools that we build into our products to try and uh, and accommodate for some of the uh, the problems that you'll find in communication out there. So we always want that chance to walk through that process first. If it's a hardware problem, we'll swap it immediately. So one of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, first is is bandwidth, and some of the reasons why we need all this extra bandwidth. And it, part of this is to make sure that as dealers, you know, we all understand how this works. But I think more importantly is this is information to have to help you convey to your client why you're selling the products you do. I think if any of us went to uh, the local tire store and explained to the salesman that we wanted to go 160 miles an hour in our Porsche, his selection of tires that he would offer would be specific to that application. I don't think we would get the Kelly tire on sale that day because it wouldn't perform at 160 miles an hour the way we would, we would like it to. Um, pretty accurate analogy. The customer wants 4K HDR, they're gonna want 8K. Well, using the right products, using the right infrastructure is part of being able to fulfill the promise and make sure that he gets what he's after. Uh, this is uh, information on this slide that uh, many people don't see on a regular basis. This deals with uh, 4K signals, and for every resolution, frame rate, color compression, depth, depth whether it has HDR or not, color gamut, uh, it shows you the, uh, the data rate that we're looking at, what we're trying to send down that pipe. Everything above that black line kind of falls into the legacy territory, HDMI 1.4, uh, 720p video. Uh, all of that works over the vast majority of HDMI cables and infrastructure that exists out there now. It's all below that 10.2 gigabit limit that we can, uh, we can send over copper in many cases. Below that line, you can see the data rates raise pretty quickly. And uh, it, uh, it's one of the sources of, uh, of the issues you're gonna run into. If you look, that uh, highlighted line is the typical Blu-ray player at full output. 13.37 gigabits. So if you're trying to, to add that Blu-ray player to a legacy system that has 10.2 gig infrastructure, you're gonna to have to back off on some features to get it to work properly. Uh, probably more familiar to most folks, an Apple TV at 4K or Roku Ultra at maximum output is 17.82 gigabits. So if you do not have a robust 18 gig infrastructure in place, you're gonna have issues. Uh, I would say, I don't think a day goes by that we don't get Apple TV tech calls in terms of how to get it to work right, 
how to enable HDR, which can be a problem. Um, so that uh, that's an example of signals we're just starting to see or have seen, you know, in fairly recent times that really start to push this 18 gig structure. And then uh, lastly, a UHD menu screen, even though the material may not be full 18 gig, the menu screen can be, which is why sometimes you'll have a, a device where you can watch the content, but the menu screen doesn't, uh, doesn't display properly. And I'm gonna show some charts here. Everyone's gonna have access to this PowerPoint after the fact. So um, you'll, you'll, you'll have a copy that you can refer to. HDR, probably the biggest factor in uh, driving bandwidth. I think everyone is, uh, is familiar with old standard definition. You know, back in those days, we were capturing all that information with the camera, using it in, uh, in mastering the film, but then we compressed that signal to get it to the, uh, to the client's house to display on a TV that quite honestly was only capable of maybe 100 nits of brightness, really couldn't display wider dynamic range. Uh, that picture changed. Now we're taking all that information that's being captured and we're sending the vast majority of it to the display at the house. And the display has the capability to process this info. Uh, this is the reason most people are buying brand new displays, color capability brightness and HDR capability. Uh, if we don't send it the signal that allows it to, uh, to maximize those features, the customer is not gonna see what they paid for. Here we're talking about the various phase, phases of uh, HDMI that uh, have implemented these features we're talking about. So back in March, 2010, HDMI 1.4 was introduced. That was 720p video, uh, no HDR, 420 color subsampling. So we were at nine gigabits, you know, pretty easy to handle over most of the infrastructure that's out there. In September of 2013, we introduced HDMI 2.0. And now suddenly we were talking about potentially 18 gigabit signals, you know, adding color subsampling up to 444, HDR up to 12 bit, uh, bit depth, and uh, obviously better image quality potential, but suddenly some of the existing infrastructure out there was starting to struggle. Now we've introduced HDMI 2.1, uh, the first uh, phases of which are going to give us 24 gigabit bandwidth signals. And uh, as time goes on and we see some of the uncompressed signals, we're going to be looking at signals up to 48 gigabits. Now through compression, we'll be able to manage most of this through 24 gigabit infrastructure, but uh, you're going to want to be looking at 48 gig or beyond in infrastructure if you want to take advantage the latest, greatest, and highest uh, signal quality possible. This is a new chart. And uh, this is the 8K version of the chart that I showed earlier. So this is going to show all the resolutions possible in HDMI 2.1. Now this, this slide shows everything up to 5K. And you'll see that in the compressed realm, we're talking up to 18 gigabits. And that's compressed to send these signals. Um, uncompressed you're looking at up to 48 gigabits in bandwidth. Go to the next slide. Uh, this, this actually shows resolutions through 10K. Uh, for the commercial realm, uh, HDMI 2.1 has a 10K spec. Uh, for residential applications, it's 8K. And you can see there that in the compressed column, we're getting up to 40 gigabits in bandwidth, uh, 48 in the uncompressed. And then you'll see uh, some there that literally can't be processed. The bandwidth is gonna to be too large. So this gives you an idea of, of where we're going and what the roadmap looks like and uh, what we need to really start thinking about in terms of creating infrastructure. I have to throw this information in. Once again, this is good stuff to talk to the right client about when you're talking about why you're specifying better, better products. This is color gamut. And this really wasn't a big topic of conversation up until recently because most displays couldn't display wide color gamut. Now you're starting to hear the, uh, the term Rec 2020 thrown around by display manufacturers because these display panels can actually start to show the, uh, the color gamut that we can provide. So this is just a little example of, of where we've been through the various versions of HDMI. With the HDMI 1.4, we were talking about Rec 709 color gamut. And that's that smallest dotted triangle. Uh, and essentially what you're looking at is a, is a chart that was created in 1931. That colored area is the range of human vision, everything the human eye can see. So these triangles represent 
what the display can actually show us. Everything inside that triangle is something that can be displayed. Everything outside the triangle cannot. So with REC 709, uh, we were representing approximately 35% of the range of human vision and color, uh, which means that you couldn't show a Coke can an actual Coke red. You can't show Caribbean blue water. You can't show the Nike swoosh in the right color. Um, literally colors that can't be displayed. You know, look pretty darn good at the time because we didn't have anything to really compare it to. But, uh, but you can see that's a pretty limited representation of, of what we see in the real world. What we watch for the most part now is that next dotted line, which is DCI-P3. That's a color space that wasn't necessarily, or color gamut that wasn't necessarily designed for our channel. Um, that's the Digital Cinema Initiatives Institute. And that was the color gamut decided on for uh, material that's sent digitally to theaters. It represents about 50% of the range of human vision and color. So it, it's an improvement, better depth, better, you know, better color saturation, but uh, it still leaves out Coke red, leaves out Caribbean blue, leaves out a lot of those other colors that, uh, that we can see in, in real life. I mentioned REC 2020, which is the current target with HDMI, actually was the current target, was the target with HDMI 2.0 and with HDMI 2.1. Uh, this represents 75% of the range of human vision and color. Now we can see all of those other colors. Obviously, there are, there are still some that fall outside the spectrum, but this is far closer to what we actually see in real life. It does make a difference. Um, the image does have more depth, does have more pop. And uh, as I said, display manufacturers are starting to talk about this. Um, this is one of the reasons we need more bandwidth, because this is one of the things that a customer is looking for when they buy that new display. So now on to uh, some of the technology that we've implemented to try and deal with this, this bandwidth. You know, how do we get it to work over existing copper? You know, what do we do when we run into a, a house that's wired with Cat5 e or Cat6? So we've taken the approach of developing our own compression algorithm. Uh, we don't use DSC compression, which is uh, commonly used in the market. We developed our own. It's called Invisible Compression Technology. And as opposed to, uh, to the other compression algorithms out there, we're only, we're only dealing with part of the signal. We're not touching HDR metadata. We're not touching color information. We're not, uh, we're not messing with uh, parts of the signal that your eye is most sensitive to. Uh, we can deliver all flavors of HDR, including Dolby Vision up to 30 frames, uh, 18 gig signals, 4K 6444, up to 12 bit. Uh, it, it is it is a better transmission technology, and uh, this is an example of an actual panel. Uh, this one's showing DSC compression with a high bandwidth signal, and you can see that banding. It isn't always that uh, that noticeable, but kind of like a dead pixel. You know, once a customer sees it, you can't really unsee it. Uh, this is that same panel, same signal, using one of our extenders, and you can see the uh, the lack of banding. Uh, if you talk to someone who uses our extenders, typically you'll hear two things. They always work and they look better. And, uh, you know, at this point, the vast majority of our growth has been dealer to dealer. It's not us telling people that our stuff works better and look better. It's one dealer telling another. So if, if you haven't tried it, ask someone who has used our stuff. And I'm, I'm sure you'll probably hear that. So we're going to talk about some of the products we have that use some of this technology. And uh, you know, if you've been through the, the rollout tour, some of my earlier trainings, you've seen some of this, but I'll, uh, I'll also address some new features, new things that have been added uh, to, uh, to try and deal with these signals. We do make a wide variety of matrix switches. We make some very unique stuff. Uh, we include features that many other manufacturers don't. And uh, a lot of things that I think are, are pretty common sense. We handle audio differently than most folks. With our switches, you can, attach the audio and bind it to the, uh, to the output. You can bind it to the input, or you can run it as a separate audio matrix. So depending on the application, whether you're using a, a control system, outboard audio system, uh, you can set the audio output to function exactly the way you'd like. We have scaling built in. This is important because uh, as we're dealing with displays of varying capabilities, and this is very common if customers updating TVs, but they're only updating some of them to 4K or potentially new 8K, 
or it's a new installation, but you've got TVs in the bathroom or TVs in the kitchen where 4K isn't even an option. Uh, we allow you to manage the output from the switch, scale it to 1080p for those TVs that can only handle 1080p without affecting the 4K uh, displays that are also part of the system. The, the sources don't even know that there's a 1080p system in the mix. Uh, there is no lowest common denominator situation with our switch. Uh, it handles each display individually. Uh, we do provide edit management. As I mentioned earlier, 85% of the calls we get are based on edit communication. Uh, we allow you to manage that communication at the switch. Uh, extremely important in creating a stable system and getting the output from the sources that, uh, that you should be getting. We allow you to manage audio delay so you don't have any lip sync issues with the switch. They all are rated for 18 gigabit bandwidth, full 4K. We do have built-in test patterns, both 1080p and 4K. So if you're deploying a system and you don't have sources yet, you need to be able to test the integrity of the path, make sure you're getting a, a picture on the display. These test patterns will allow you to do that on the job. And they're HTCP 2.2 compliant. Uh, we also have uh, several models now that have built-in 7.1 down mixing. We'll look at those as well. Many of you have seen our matrix switch lineup. Uh, a lot of you have seen our little four by two. That's meant uh, for smaller applications and to bypass the video sections of more antiquated product that can't handle full 4K. Uh, that, that piece has been popular enough that we now have two eight by two versions, one rack mount and one component version. Uh, it's really the same as the four by two, but accommodates more inputs for those larger systems. Um, those have been extremely popular pieces. And of course, we've got a four by four, an eight by eight, actually several versions of the eight by eight. Uh, we do make one without scalers for a system that doesn't require it. And we do have the only one rack space 16 by 16 on the market. Uh, that's not our only 16 by 16 now, but it's our only one used 16 by 16. So if you're space constricted, um, that is the piece to look at. Uh, I talked about new features. Uh, one of the recent firmware updates with our switches added what you'll see under video scaling mode is an HDBT mode or HD base T compatibility mode. That will allow you, if you're installing this switch in a legacy system with 10.2 gig infrastructure, to set the HDMI output to still deliver 4K, but it strips the signal down to get it below 10.2 gigs. Um, it, uh, it's an encode only process, so it will allow you to send 4K to those 4K TVs that. Uh, you know, are, are attached to a 10.2 gig HDMI cable and there's just no way to up, update that. And so it gives you a little added flexibility to be able to deal with those, those legacy applications. We do make a variety of HD base T switches and these all incorporate the uh, invisible compression technology that I talked about. We've got a four by four, an eight by eight, We've also got a couple of versions with full audio down mixing, as I mentioned earlier. We've got that in an eight by eight, and also in our new 16 by 16 modular chassis, which we'll talk about more in just a moment. So we make several receivers for HD base T matrix switches. Uh, the one that we've been selling to, for the longest period of time is our AC EX7444 RNE. That's a 70 meter full 4K 18 gig receiver. Um, very tiny unit meant to go behind the display. We've added a couple of additional options um, in recent months. One, which is kind of out of the box, is this little AC CX100 ramp. Uh, that's actually a little switch that also works in our Conforex line of uh, wall plates and presentation switches. But in this application, it can be a, a unique endpoint for an HD base T switch. Uh, it has an HD base T input. It also has an HDMI input. So if you had a local input, say a Nextbox, uh, it would accommodate that. It can be controlled via IP, IR, or 232. It does have a mic input. It's got an auxiliary audio input, as well as audio de-embedding and both analog and toslink audio outputs. And it's got a built-in 25 watt per channel amplifier, uh, as well as being eARC capable. So this could be put behind a TV, say in a bedroom, and could power the local speakers or soundbar, 
uh, could integrate with your local sources and really be a, a unique solution for that sort of application while still being attached to the, to the centralized distribution. And then, probably one of the biggest announcements that we've made in quite some time, our 16 by 16 uh, modular chassis. And this is unique in the market. Uh, initially introduced as just an HD based D product, but we've expanded the, uh, the input card offerings and output card offerings. So for input cards, we have uh, two possibilities. We've got an input card that does dot, uh, audio extraction. So if it's a two channel PCM audio stream, you can extract a, an audio stream both to the Toslink or uh, analog audio outputs. And then we've got a full audio down mixing input card, which will extract a two channel audio stream from uh, all audio formats and allow you to distribute that to the rest of the, uh, of the system. For output cards, we have the HD based output card that we started with, and uh, this does use our ICT compression. It has a mirrored HDMI output, uh, which can be commonly used as, a, say, an audio output to a local AVR while you send the HD based to the display. That HDMI is mirrored to the first HD based output on that card. And then we recently introduced an HDMI output card. We've actually got two HDMI output cards now, but we're showing the one here with seamless switching. Now this incorporates some new technology and I'll be talking about it further with, a, with another piece, but uh, this provides a whole new level of system stability and signal stability. What the, uh, what the card can do is allow you to set the output of the HDMI a specific scale of output, whether that be 4K30, 420, uh, 1080p, whatever the, uh, the display can handle most easily, might be 4K60, 420, 4K60, 422, wh whatever the output is that you want to dictate. Uh, it also has an adaptive scaling mode, which means that if it sees an input below 1080p, it will scale that to, 10, to a 1080p. If it's over 1080p, say it's a 4K HDR signal, it passes that through untouched. This can be a game changer when it comes to dealing with things like a direct TV receiver, which has a tendency to spit out any variety of signals. Um, a lot of TVs these days don't like to see 720p. You know, they don't like to see 1080i. Um, this card will actually convert interlace to progressive, will convert frame rate, and will make sure that the TV sees what it, uh, what it wants to see. Most importantly, is that when you switch sources, this device will continue to send a signal to the TV at that same resolution. It's a black splash screen, although it goes by in a second. What that means is that the handshake is never lost with the display. There's no re-authentication. So it's seamless switching. You don't get that several seconds of black unsupported signal screen or whatever your display might choose to show you. And with some projectors or some higher end displays, that could be 30 seconds, 45 seconds of switching time. So this will eliminate that. Uh, truly, uh, you know, uh, as I said, groundbreaking technology to create a more stable system. Uh, and commercial applications, it can be huge. You know, if you're doing a courtroom system, 15 seconds of black screen isn't really acceptable or, or a sports bar. Um, same thing with some residential applications. It's just a thought of what the 16 by 16 looks like when it's blank. We do custom build these. Uh, it takes about a 24 hour build time. Uh, and uh, we, we do want to talk to you as we spec it to make sure that uh, we're covering all the bases. But it's a relatively quick process. So under HD base T receivers, as I mentioned, uh, we also had a groundbreaking product there. We've taken that scaling technology I just talked about with the HDMI output card I'm going to apply it to a new HD base T receiver, the EX70 SC2R. So this gives you all those same features in an HD base T receiver that works with our extenders, our matrix switches, or even other people's HD base T products, and allows you to apply that scaling technology. So if you put this at the receiving end uh, with a display that maybe has been a problem, doesn't like to handshake, loses handshake every couple of days. Um, this stabilizes that signal, but you send it exactly what it wants to see and make sure that it doesn't drop the handshake. Um, this can be an extremely valuable solution piece. And uh, even now, is, uh, I'm sure your experience is like ours. Sales may have dropped off a little bit with the current scenario, but tech support calls have not. People are home using their systems more often. 
you know, they're discovering deficiencies that maybe didn't bother them before or trying to do things they haven't tried to do before. Um, this technology can help address a lot of those issues of, hey, why does my screen go black? How come sometimes at handshakes I have to go switch inputs again to get it to handshake correctly? Um, this can be a, a very worthwhile solution to look at. Uh, we do make a lot of extenders. I just mentioned those. This is a chart that you'll find on our website and in our product guide that compares all the different extenders we make, bandwidth capabilities, distance capabilities. You will notice that the first two on the list are fiber extenders. Uh, we're expanding that lineup as well. Uh, the, the rest that you'll see are copper products. Anything with a 444 in the model number is a full 18 gig 4K product. Um, anything below that is a 10.2 gig product. There are still certainly applications for those in, in certain cases. So I mentioned fiber. Uh, this is our current offering for an uncompressed fiber kit. As Stephen mentioned, uh, there is an advantage to sending uncompressed video. Um, as he mentioned, about 880,000 colors difference comparing uncompressed to compressed. Now, you know, to keep that in context, that's in, in, in the context of about 16.8 million colors. So is it night and day? Depending on the display device, possibly not. But uh, once again, Customers are buying new displays because of the capabilities, because of the color capabilities, and to be able to, uh, to feed it a signal that takes full advantage of those capabilities can be important. Uh, this will go up to 300 meters on a single mode or multi-mode fiber, and that's a single fiber. Uh, full HDR support, including Dolby Vision up to 60 frames. Uh, it does support audio return channel and has a built-in ethernet port. Uh, this is a terrific extender. It's been highly successful. Uh, I will disclose, I mentioned that we have a, a product pipeline. We have a new uncompressed fiber extender that uh, honestly, we introduced it at Cedia. And uh, with, uh, with the current coronavirus situation, it set us back a little while, but the unit is in production and we should uh, see it here in the States relatively soon. Um, but the only thing I can really tell you at this point is that because of, uh, of how things have progressed since we, we theoretically introduced it, the price point is now gonna be sig significantly lower than what we initially talked about. I'm not gonna get into exact numbers yet, but uh, I think everyone will be very excited when this product hits the shelf and, uh, and kind of starts to, to move into copper extender territory. Uh, so, I mean, even, even our current extenders at their current price points make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, we're now at the point where designing your systems to actually use the copper that's being put in the walls makes sense. Uh, we do have another fiber extender currently in the lineup. This was the first one that we introduced. Uh, this one does use, and I, I apologize, I just noticed the verbiage here says uncompressed. It does use our ICT compression. So unmeasurable effects on the, on the signal, but, but it does have slight compression. It does also have the advantage, however, of being able to go 2000 meters on a single mode fiber. It's not limited to the 300 meters that uh, the uncompressed unit is. So if you've got a gatehouse, a compound house in the next town, um, you can go an extreme distance with this and uh, reliably transmit full 4K HDR video. Uh, this does have audio return channel, does have test patterns and scaling. It does not have the built-in ethernet switch that the uncompressed unit does. And then we get into some of our, uh, our features that we build into our, our extenders. And as I mentioned earlier, we build features into our products that allow you to, to accommodate for what you're gonna find on the job. Uh, scaling is one. Our extenders have it built into them because you may show up to a job that's full 4K, but you're adding a 1080p TV. We're trying to get a 1080p to work correctly. Um, this will allow you to scale at the extender, set the EDID properly, and the system, once again, won't see the 1080p TV elsewhere, and you won't affect what's already being transmitted to the existing 4K TVs. We have EDID management built into our extenders. Extremely important. There's a built-in EDID table. A set EDID you can choose, and then it also has the ability to copy the EDID information from any display already on the job site. And uh, just to step back, 
just to make sure everyone is on board with what he did is talking about. Uh, I do talk about it quite a bit and didn't mean to necessarily skip over it, but we're talking about extended display identification data. So this is the one-way communication from a display to a source telling it um, what it's capable of. And the source looks at that and adjusts its output accordingly. It's errors in that communication that uh, are the crux of most of the issues we deal with. If it's just a source plugged into a display, you typically don't have any errors. It's talking directly to the display. It's when we start putting components in between the source and the display that the communication starts to sometimes fail. Uh, so having this ability in the extender to compensate for that can be huge. Mentioned audio return. We have four extender kits that incorporate audio return channel. Uh, we do have one that allows you to do it via Toslink as well as HDMI. We, uh, we have two copper kits and two fiber kits. It's important, I think, at this point to point out that uh, over copper, there is not a chipset right now that will accommodate eARC. And uh, this could be important going forward. Uh, one of the advantages of eARC is greatly expanded audio bandwidth capability. So it allows you to send uh, Dolby Atmos or DTS HD master audio back to the head end. Um, that's gonna be possible over fiber and our fiber extenders will be able to get a firmware update to allow that. The copper extenders right now, there is no solution. So if your customer is concerned about using their Sony master series TV to, to use as a source for you know, Netflix uh, calibrated mode, you're gonna need eARC or, or, a, or some way to get that audio back to the head end. So running fiber is a good idea. We also make a couple of scalers and converters, once again, in the, in the realm of managing these signals, trying to get everything to, to play nicely together. Uh, our SC1 scaler has been in the lineup for a while. It is a 1080p to 4K or vice versa scaler. It has left and right audio de-embedding. It's also an EDID manager. Uh, it does have some other unique capabilities I'll talk about in a minute. Our SC2 scaler is our standalone piece that incorporates that scaling technology I've been talking about. Uh, both in the HDMI output card for our modular switch and for the SC2 uh, or the EX70 SC2R HD based here receiver. This is an HDMI scaler that can be used to stabilize the signal in the same fashion if you've got an existing HDMI issue. And uh, I've used this to, uh, to stabilize EDID communication information between an audio piece, say a preamp and, and a switch. Uh, just to make sure that uh, that audio doesn't drop out. It, it, it's really a, a, a very powerful system fixer. Uh, I think scalar is a, is a misnomer. Um, I think we're gonna probably come up with a better way to describe what it does, but it's a very powerful piece and, uh, and can be a great solution item. And we also recently came out with a, uh, an HDMI to display port converter. This is useful in uh, applications where you run into a display port only monitor, uh, mainly in, uh, in medical applications, but, but you will see them occasionally. So I mentioned uh, a unique feature of the SC1, and this goes to ma maximizing the existing infrastructure. Uh, if you've got a situation where you want to upgrade a display, say to full 4K, and the existing infrastructure, whether it's a cable, whether it's an extender set, whether it's an old switch, is only capable of 10.2 gigabits and it's not replaceable, then uh, you've got a dilemma. So what we did was with the SC1, we allow you to enable what's called HDBST compatibility mode. And this is a little different than uh, what we're implementing on our matrix switches in that this is an encode and decode process. So we use an SC1 at the source to encode that material and compress it down below 10.2 gigabits to allow you to send it over that existing, maybe it's a cable in a, a vaulted ceiling or an existing switch that the customer is not gonna replace. Send it through the existing structure, use another SC1 at the display to re-expand that signal to the full 4K. Uh, this is an inexpensive way to get around a problem that otherwise would have you tearing apart ceilings or walls or, or possibly you know, trying to send a new 4K display 1080p, which uh, is probably not what the customer is after. And then uh, 
and bandwidth and fiber without talking about uh, active optical cables. And Stephen brought these up earlier. Uh, these are a joint project between ourselves and Clearline. So although you may see other active optical cables on the market, if it's not from Clearline or from us, you will not be seeing a cable that has real Clearline fiber inside of it. Uh, now we are working on links beyond 40 meters, um, 60, 80, and 100 meter cables are, are still being finalized, but we will have longer versions available. Uh, by far, you know, the, the, the biggest differentiator with these cables is the fact that, as Stephen explained, you could cut the end off and use the fiber inside as you would any other bulk fiber. So when you're pulling these cables, not only are you pulling a cost-effective way to get full uncompressed 48 gig signals to the display, but you're pre-wiring with fiber that will have lifespan long beyond uh, being an HDMI cable. If you run uh, one of the other active optical cables with the proprietary plastic fiber in them, at some point they become nothing but an expensive pull string for the next cable. Um, so these are uh, these are truly a uh, a great solution, and it's a it's a win win both for you going forward and for the customer. As I said, it's a very cost effective way to get a, a full 48 gig signal. And these are HDMI 2.1 certified. We're an HDMI 2.1 certified vendor. Uh, these are ISF certified. And they made all of the HDMI 2.1 bullet points. Uh, pull 48 gig, 120 frames per second, uh, fixed rate link, variable refresh rate, eARC. Uh, it, it checks all the boxes. They have become incredibly popular. And so I must disclose that we're sold out for approximately another two and a half weeks. We've got a ton coming in, but uh, we found ourselves caught short in terms of the demand versus supply. That will not be the case as soon as they hit the shores again, but uh, I try to order one today. I'll have to tell you that uh, it'll be about two and a half weeks. And then lastly, a couple of brand new products that I want to point out, and uh, we'll tie this up. This is something that we, we recently introduced. This is our Fresco 4 video wall processor. So it's a one by four processor. We're talking about video walls, so not multi-view, not individual images on each screen, but one screen over multiple displays. Um, this has been a, a popular piece. And I, I mainly put this slide up here so I can talk about something that isn't actually in the presentation yet, but is, uh, is due to hit the shelves very shortly. We're introducing a Fresco Cap 9. That will be a one by nine video wall processor that is also capable of HDR. So full 4K HDR video wall processor um, really opens up uh, some digital signage possibilities, some commercial possibilities, and in the Resi world, lets you build one really big, great looking 4K HDR display out of some of the new bezel-less or near bezel-less consumer panels that are out there. So for an extremely reasonable cost, you can build say a 180 inch direct view display for your customer's game room or theater room, really knock the socks off and this is going to hit at a price point that is unprecedented. Um, I'm not going to throw the Cap 9 price point out there yet, but the Cap 4 is at 675 bucks. The Cap 9 will be at a similarly aggressive price point. And I think you'll find a lot of potential applications for it. Uh, second brand new thing that I will introduce is the Meridio 4K HDMI field test monitor. Um, this is a 7-inch full 4K HDR test monitor. It's got built-in analyzation functions, so it will, it will analyze the signal and tell you what the incoming signal is. It will analyze EDIDs, it'll let you read and write EDIDs. It's got an HDMI pass-through, so this could be permanently mounted in a rack. It can be battery powered, so you can carry it around on a job site and use it for dialing in a distributed video system or uh, setting up 4K cameras. Um, extremely powerful piece, and it is only $599. So in the, uh, in our test equipment lineup, it's by far the most reasonable piece that we have that allows you to actually analyze the signal. And uh, it has a lot of other very useful functions. On top of that, it's, it's 12 volt DC, 1.5 amp, be one heck of a mobile monitor as well. Um, so I, I think it's a really unique piece. It's got some unique applications. As I said, EDID management, it's full 4K with HDR, seven inches built-in analyzer, and it is HDMI 2.3 compliant. Um, now, if the HDCP issue, I won't get into deeply here. You're gonna to start to see some 2.3 products. Uh, 
as before, it, uh, HTCP will be backwards compatible with uh, with all current versions if you're trying to send it a, a, an HTC, uh, HTCP 2.2 signal. There will at some point be features that are part of HTCP 2.3 that will require that uh, the products be 2.3 certified. And we'll talk more about that as time goes on as it relates to our products and our test equipment. And then very lastly, we've talked a lot about bandwidth, about signals, about uh, how to manage these. Uh, we're big on test equipment and the Fox and Hound is the one that I talk about the most. This is meant for integrators. This is a piece of equipment that actually lets you see what I've been talking about. Plug it into a source and see what it's outputting. See what the bandwidth is, what the color space is, what the resolution is. Uh, you can plug it into a display and it will let you look at the EDID, let you see what the display is asking for, and then let you look and see what the, all the intermediate components in the chain are asking for to really diagnose where the problems are coming from. Uh, without a tech piece of test equipment, there's just no way to quantify what you're seeing. So this is a, uh, this is a piece I talk about a lot. Um, Volutone has a great deal on these. If you, uh, if you don't have one, I suggest you look into it. I'm more than happy to answer questions, uh, but the guys at Volutone also should have them and uh, can take care of you as well. You can measure bandwidth, as I mentioned. You can test 4K cables. You can plug a cable in and verify the bandwidth. You can test for HTCP. It'll tell you which version and whether or not it's present. It'll test audio just to confirm that you're getting audio on the uh, on the transmission. It lets you manage EDID, so you can actually read the EDID of a display. You can copy the EDID and save it. You can use it to teach other devices. Uh, one of those things that unless you have the ability to actually look at it, it's hard to tell what's really going on in communication. And it's battery powered. It lasts for about three hours of continuous use on a job site. So it really is an ideal. Uh, an ideal test tool to keep on a van. And, you know, it, I always look at investment in tools and, you know, what, what's your return? Um, I think I look at this two ways. One is tracking down an HDMI problem if you don't have a test tool is really a matter of just plucking and chucking, replacing products to see whether or not that's the issue. That can be very costly and time consuming. Uh, so simply cutting down your troubleshooting time and narrowing it to the offending piece within 45 minutes rather than two days saves a lot of money. Uh, I would also use it as a sales tool. You go to specify a new system with existing infrastructure, take this out there and use it to evaluate what's already on the job. You'll end up with a more accurate bid, you'll look more professional in front of the customer and uh, you'll be able to, to confidently tell them which cables are gonna work, which aren't gonna work and which parts of the system need to be upgraded. Uh, you know, I always use the analogy, would you take your car to someone who didn't have a code reader and was trying to diagnose your engine? Uh, most clients understand that. They wouldn't take that Mercedes in the driveway to someone who didn't have some way to plug it in and see what was actually going on. Instead, just kind of put their ear on the hood and try to guess what it was. Um, so all good reasons why this is worth a look. So there's my email address. As I said, everyone's gonna get a copy of this uh, presentation. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. Uh, more than happy to answer them or forward them on to uh, the appropriate party to answer them for you. Hopefully this wasn't too deep in the weeds, but I wanted to give you some information that maybe we didn't cover before and uh, some real ammo in terms of uh, designing your systems. And with that, I'll turn it back to Gary, but uh, thank you all for the time. Great job, Steve. It's, I know, it's such a huge product lineup there. And, um, but I do want to uh, actually, is there anything between the two Steves that you would like to kind of combine or talk about maybe even in terms of product that, uh, or solutions that you'd like to uh, emulate as, as a combo to our panelists? Well, there's, there's one thing I'll add, um, and I'm hesitant to do it, but, but I'm going to because I think it's important. I talked about our modular fiber switch. We have a fiber output card for that switch, which is, uh, which is a big deal. Full disclosure, I got uh, a couple handfuls of them back in December. I've got two systems out there working properly. Then all of this came down and we couldn't get our hands in anymore. We will have them shortly. Um, I'm, I'm a, a believer in not trying to push product that I can't deliver in a short time frame because I don't want anyone designing with it in mind. But, uh, but they are on the near horizon. And that's a big part of our, of our expansion into fiber technology. And uh, 
you know, Stephen and I are going to be working more and more together as we develop more products under that heading because it, it really is the future. You know, if you look at what I just said in terms of bandwidth, some of the, the some of the the signals we have to look forward to, you know, logic tells you that fiber is going to be the way to do it. Was um, that technology done in conjunction with Clearline, Steve, Stephen, or yeah? The yeah. Yeah, there's um, one job we can talk about and one job we can't. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, the awesome thing is, is that those those products came out and everything is working perfect. And on one of the jobs, we're looking at a mass, mass deployment and the sheer size of it. So it, it was pretty exciting to... Uh, Steve and I actually met with the dealer after the install was done um, as we were passing through town and the response from them about how it worked and what it looked like and everything was was exactly what we both wanted to hear. It was seamless, it was perfect, and you can't ask for anything better. Oh, excellent. That's a great report. Uh, well, I don't see any more questions. Um, Silvino, Jesus, David, Another David, Bruce, uh, Bernard, anything you'd like to ask the panelists? Now's the time. Um, I'm going to start rendering this video and then I'm going to combine uh, the slide decks that you guys saw and uh, it, I'll get it back out at four o'clock today. So you guys please review or at least pass it on to your team over the weekend or have them review the fiber discussion and the AV Pro uh, product lineup. It's, it's, it's very useful. And then of course, the Volutone team, the AllNet team, uh, um, uh, all of us for the SNAP local AV uh, uh, or distributors uh, are all pretty in tune with, with what's going on here. So be more than glad to answer your questions. Uh, I mean, that's it guys, if that's gonna be it, let's get on with our Fridays. Steve Baker, thank you so much, great job. I see a huge speaker in the background, man. You must just blast Pink Floyd. You know, I, I bet he's about to do that right now as soon as he's done with work today. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's a Gloria Estefan. Oh yeah, well, whatever works. <laughs> whatever works. Um, and Stephen Ricks, your technical prowess, appreciate it as always. Um, I can't wait to get back together with you, with you folks, and get live in front of the dealers again. But uh, from everybody at Volume Tone and the Snap AV locals, thank you guys so much. Look for your email at four o'clock today, gentlemen. Thank you guys so much. Be safe out there. We will see you soon. From all of us, thanks, Scott. See you later. Thank you.